Welcome to Tarantulas in the Terrarium Volume 1. I'm Michael Jacoby coming to you from my spider shop in Nashville, Tennessee. The tarantula hobby has exploded in recent years and there's been a corresponding thirst for knowledge about how to properly keep and breed these fascinating pets. This DVD does not intend to take the place of the book. Subjects such as taxonomy, natural history, biology, anatomy, and even many husband related topics are best covered in great detail in print. The purpose of this DVD is to illustrate methods that can be better explained visually, exploiting the media of film. In short, I want to show you some of the tricks of the trade that I've developed over several decades of tarantula keeping. I would argue that despite the internet and other media such as even this DVD, a good book such as Dr. Sam Marshall's Tarantulas and Other Arachnids is the best resource for information regarding tarantula keeping. So make sure you pick up a good book and supplement that learning by using internet sources such as arachnoboards.com or the British Tarantula Society Forum. I also highly recommend you join a tarantula society and interact with its membership. The oldest tarantula society in the world is the British Tarantula Society, which can be found online at thebts.co.uk, and the American Tarantula Society can be found at atshq.org. This DVD is going to take you step by step through some of the basics of tarantula keeping, showing you techniques that I have developed over many years. Our hobby is still relatively young, and even highly experienced keepers are still learning all the time. My methods are not necessarily the right way, just what has worked well for me over some 30 years. I hope having this visual insight will benefit you, and more importantly, the tarantulas you keep. Before we dive into tarantulas in the terrarium, I should mention again that this is just volume one. To be honest, I had hoped I could fit twice as many topics into this first video, but it was more important that I covered everything very thoroughly and provided sufficient video footage to make everything understandable. So watch for additional videos in this series, which will cover everything from breeding to packaging for shipping. We're going to begin by taking a little field trip. Although internet animal dealers and retailers are great sources for spiders and supplies, and more and more reptile shows feature serious arachnid dealers, there is no better place to seek new products and find all the essential items needed for proper care than a good specialist pet shop that caters to the reptile hobby. Many of the products used for, by tarantula keepers are actually designed for reptile keepers. So we're going to visit my friend Danielle who works at Nashville's best reptile shop, Aquatic Critter. This aquarium and terrarium store takes up an entire strip mall and has an extensive variety of tarantulas and other arachnids. Danielle will teach us the basics and show us products that are of interest to tarantula keepers. Try us about 20 minutes or so, but I'll speed. You ready? Let's take a look at some of the most popular choices for tarantula housing. In the past, the aquarium was one of the only enclosures available and they are still popular and new custom sizes and styles are available. But let's first look at the increasingly popular enclosure, the Critter Keeper or her Haven. Her Havens are an excellent choice of enclosure or housing for a tarantula. Uh, there are multiple different choices that you can orient properly for different species. Something like these shallow, low-profile perp havens work great for terrestrial tarantulas, so you don't have to worry about the animals climbing and potentially falling and injuring themselves. Another good option is the larger, somewhat taller perp haven that can also be vertically oriented to accommodate a completely arboreal tarantula. It's entirely possible to set it on its side and use it that way. These can also be modified slightly to uh, properly house tarantulas that come from different portions of the world. Tarantulas that need significantly higher humidity than others, you can always tape up the inside of this lid with clear packing tape 
and that will hold in a good amount of ambient humidity that's necessary for multiple species of tarantulas or for some of the more arid specimens you can always leave it as is. Cricket keepers are a very good option for housing tarantulas prey. They make it very easy to accommodate and properly house prey animals such as crickets and sometimes even cockroaches. They're equipped with these tubes with serrated insides so that the prey can climb up on the inside. The tubes can easily be pulled out and you can dispense a proper amount of prey to the tarantulas. They come in multiple sizes also. Of course, there are also the ever-popular choices of aquariums. I do have some custom-built enclosures that are very appropriate for different species of tarantulas. There is, again, the lower profile, what we call the half-ten tank. It's the same um, frame as, as a ten-gallon tank, but it's significantly shorter to accommodate the terrestrial species of tarantulas. And then there are these multiple arboreal tanks that also work very well to accommodate um, things like species of Bacillotherias and other arboreal oriented spiders. There are also several options of substrate that are decorative as well as practical for different types of tarantulas. Something like Eco Earth is a very finely ground coconut fiber um, that can be used on species that require a more arid or a more humid environment depending on how you use it. There's also the option of jungle mix, which is a mixed mulch that still looks good and natural and is still very practical for multiple species of tarantulas. And the moss, this is beaked moss that comes dry but is typically meant to be wetted to maintain ambient humidity for some of the species of tarantulas that desire a more humid environment. As far as using water bowls for tarantulas, there are also several options. Many people are used to the archaic and more outdated options of water dishes accommodating sponges or even things like cricket water or acrylamide. Those are not only breeding grounds for bacteria, but they're typically terribly inadequate for tarantula. What we prefer to use instead are very shallow water dishes containing clean water. Although tarantulas don't readily drink that often. Most of the water and hydration that they obtain comes directly from their prey. It's still always a very good idea to keep a very good clean water source in there for your pet tarantula. Options like this shallow water dish or the less attractive but still very practical kidney dishes or even these small crock dishes work very very well for your tarantula. It is paramount however that you do keep clean water in for any specimen of tarantula. Hiding places are a very important feature for your pet tarantula. Of course, it's necessary to research what type of accommodations your pet tarantula needs. Typically, your old world specimens are heavy burrowers, and they need to be provided with deep substrate that will accommodate their burrowing habits. And then there are, of course, the arboreal species of spiders that need to be provided with foliage, climbing utensils, things like that. But there are also the hide caves that are necessary for many species of completely terrestrial tarantulas. Well, spiders are by, by nature a very, very reclusive animal and they need to be provided with something that makes them feel comfortable. And a hiding cave or a hiding rock, a hiding log, whatever you decide that you like the looks of will accommodate that. Many of these silk and plastic plants not only blend to the beauty of an enclosure, but they also make an arboreal spider feel much more comfortable. Things like these silk plants are equipped with suction cups so that they can be affixed to the sides of an enclosure. There are also things like these synthetic vines, either with leaves or without, and then of course the ever popular and relatively clean choice of cork bark. Most tarantulas are fine at a warm room temperature. However, if you're noticing that your tarantula is not eating, supplemental heat may be added, usually via the heat pad. The heat pad can be applied to the side of a vertically oriented tank or to the bottom of a terrestrial tank. Of course, you do need to regulate the heat pad. The best way to do this is to use a thermostat. 
and a good practice in any tank with or without supplemental heat is a thermometer as well as a hygrometer like for instance this made by Zilla that is a thermometer and hygrometer combination that can be read digitally. That was a nice little outing, wasn't it? Thanks to Danielle for uh, all that useful information. If you're ever in Nashville, please stop by Aquatic Critter to see one of the best aquarium and reptile and tarantula stores you'll ever see. With over 100 tarantula species available to North American hobbyists, covering all the popular Theraphosid spiders and arachnoculture is far beyond the scope of this DVD. Here I will only briefly mention a handful of common species from both the New World and Old World. New World species inhabit the Western Hemisphere of the Americas. Most of these tarantulas have urticating hairs that they use in defense and are generally less prone to strikes or bites in defense than their Old World or Eastern Hemisphere counterparts. Old world tarantulas do not have these urticating hairs and may be quick to defend by biting. Of course, there are plenty of nervous quick to bite and defense new world tarantulas, and I'm only speaking in the very broadest terms here, but old world species are typically terrarium animals for those with a bit of experience, whereas neophyte keepers should start with some of the calmer new world species. There is perhaps no better icon of the tarantula hobby than Brachypelma smithy. This is the classic pet species. It is hardy and can be very docile, but it is a notorious flicker of urticating hairs, which can cause a strong reaction in some people. Brachypelma albopelosum is a personal favorite of mine. These large fuzzy spiders from Central America can be very docile and don't have the tendency for hair flicking found in Mexican brachys. This is a good beginner species. Another personal favorite is Aphinopelma simani. Very hardy and docile, specimens are still wild caught and imported from Nicaragua and Guatemala, but I recommend always buying captive bred, especially from Costa Rican stock like you see here. The genus Gramostola contains some of the hobby's calmest and hardiest species. This is the most common and inexpensive pet trade tarantula, Gramostola rosea. Members of the genus Acanthoscuria are easy to raise and make wonderful display spiders with large size and high contrast pattern. However, they are nervous and defensive and best left alone. Lanciadora parahybana is a huge species that is very popular. One egg sac can produce 2,000 young, so it is very inexpensive and readily available. Capable of 9 to 10 inch leg spans, this is the easiest to keep of the giant tarantulas. The Green Bottle Blue, Chromatopelma cyaneopubescens, is an incredibly colored spider from an arid climate that makes an exceptional display specimen. Babies feed aggressively and grow quickly and are among the most popular tarantulas in the hobby. Gramostola pulchra is a beautiful jet black tarantula that typically has a very calm temperament. It is in high demand among hobbyists and although very pricey is well worth it. The arboreal tarantulas of the genus Avicularia, collectively called pink does, are very popular pet tarantulas. My favorite variety by far is the large and calm species known as Metallica. It is a great candidate for a naturalistic vivarium. Tarantulas of the genus Ceratogyrus are called horn baboon spiders due to the unusual foveal protuberance that rises from their carapace. Although these can be feisty spiders, they are easy to care for and breed and are good introductions to the old world tarantulas. Popularly known as the orange bitey thing due to its highly defensive and nervous temperament, the Usambara orange or red color form of Pteranochilus marinus is a very beautiful and hardy spider that makes a good look but don't touch display animal. Of the ornamental tarantulas or tiger spiders of the genus Pisolotheria, the classic Indian variety P. regalis is the best first pokey. However, the genus is best left to more experienced keepers due to its temperament, size, speed, and comparatively strong venom. The undisputed jewel of the tarantula hobby is the coveted Goody Sapphire Ornamental Pisolotheria Metallica. Although this is still a pricey spider, it is a very hardy ornamental tarantula and one of the calmer species. If it's in your budget, it's a very good first pokey. 
There are a few aspects of tarantula keeping that are more hotly debated than substrate choice. This isn't a new argument either. People have run this subject into the ground over the years. I'm going to show you some reasonable choices and tell you what I prefer and why. But more importantly, I'll tell you what not to use and let you discover through trial and error what works best for you and your spiders. Don't take anyone's preference as gospel, and don't assume that one substrate is best for all of the different species you keep. And as always, listen to your spiders. They don't speak, but like any animal in captivity, careful observation of their behavior can tell you all that you need to know. If you decide to try the substrate that some self-anointed expert is singing the praises of on the internet, and one or more of your tarantulas spends the next week or more hanging upside down from the lid of the cage, it is reasonable to assume that the spider isn't really a fan of the change. Pet trade compressed coconut fiber bricks such as Zumed Zico Earth, T-Rex's Forest Bed, and Bed of Beast are very popular and easy to find. One product that I personally dislike but is popular in North America is vermiculite. This product is heat expanded mica and it is used as a soil conditioner to allow, for example, potting soil to retain moisture while still providing good aeration. It is cheap and clean but it is also ugly and dusty. It is readily available at garden centers, home centers, and superstores. You can save money by buying bulk bags at indoor gardening supply stores. What I have here is actually a fine grade that I use as reptile egg incubating media. If you want to use this product, I strongly recommend you seek out the coarser grade, which is less likely to stick to a tarantula's mouth parts or any other damp area. Vermiculite is also used by keepers in conjunction with other substrates we will discuss. This is where vermiculite is most useful. For example, the next substrate we will cover is peat moss, and mixing vermiculite in with it will make the combination substrate have much more structural integrity, which is important for burrowing spiders. Fans of peat who keep tarantulas such as the Asian obligate burrowers like Capopelma typically add vermiculite to aid in moisture retention, but, perhaps more importantly, also add it to make the form burrow strong as pure peat tends to crumble and doesn't facilitate strong tunnels. Peat moss, more properly called sphagnum peat moss, is obtained from bogs, often in northern areas like Canada. You can buy it in small bags such as this, or save a lot of money by buying it in large commercial bales. Fans of peat like it because it is inexpensive, and the natural acidity of the product helps prevent mold and fungus. Again, these problems are better prevented by removing waste and food remains, and providing sufficient ventilation, but peat moss does seem to control mold, even if it does often sprout fluorescent yellow mushrooms. Sphagnum peat moss should not be confused with regular sphagnum moss, which is often marketed as orchid moss. Although they have the same origins, good quality long fiber sphagnum moss, such as I have here, is great as an additive to substrate, both for moisture retention and because it is aesthetically pleasing. A layer of sphagnum moss over your substrate of choice provides a moisture barrier and it is often incorporated into retreats by copious silk users like avicularia tree tarantulas and members of the Asian genus Kilobrachis. My favorite use of sphagnum moss is to add the, a damp sprig or two to vials containing spiderlings, especially arboreal species. This gives a climbing surface and a place for support and silk attachment during the molting process in addition to the moisture holding aspects already mentioned. Long fiber sphagnum moss or orchid moss is also excellent in naturalistic vivaria. It should be used damp as a bed underneath live green moss to give the green moss a support structure in which it can root. Before we talk about a few other choices and things you should never use, let's talk about what I use. Again, just because I use it doesn't make it right, and what works for one person or one type of spider might not work as well or at all for others. But over decades of using every substrate imaginable, I choose coconut core. This product is sold in compressed bricks and it is widely available at both pet stores and indoor gardening shops. I have had great luck using coconut core and like how it holds moisture but gradually dries out as long as it's not overly wet to begin with. The ecology minded conservationist in me also likes the fact that it is an organic product that is the byproduct of another industry, coconuts for food. Coconut trees are raised on plantations and when the coconuts are harvested all of the shell is used for other products including the ground fiber that is compressed and sold as reptile arachnid substrate. I like to use something that not only works really well, but is good for the environment and can even be recycled after using it by adding it to a compost heap or tilling it into your garden or house plants.
One common complaint I get regarding coconut coir is its expense. These people just aren't shopping in the right places. No, it isn't as cheap as peat, but this very large brick that will expand to produce a heck of a lot of substrate was purchased at my local indoor gardening shop for only $13. Yes, four to five dollar bricks can add up, but if you have an indoor grow store in your area, you can purchase it much more reasonably. Another good choice for substrate is one of the mixtures that are marketed in the reptile trade. A product such as this one, ESU Reptiles Jungle Mix, is probably too expensive for the serious tarantula keeper, but for those that only have a couple of spiders or a small number of spiderlings and rearing vials, a product like this is easy to obtain and doesn't require adding water. This product is sterilized and contains a mixture of virgin organic soil, fine grain sand, vermiculite, peat moss, orchid bark, and green tree moss. It's a nice little mix that you should be able to find at any of the pet superstores or your reptile specialty pet shop. Today there is a huge variety of small containers that are used to raise early instar or spiderling tarantulas. In the old days we used baby food jars, but now polystyrene vials such as these made by Thornton Plastics are by far the most widespread spiderling rearing containers. Since vials are also used to ship spiders, hobbyists who make online purchases start to accumulate quite a collection of these vials in assorted sizes. Thornton only sells them in large case quantities, so they are best obtained by asking online tarantula dealers. I rear young tarantulas in these vials with a preference for taller vials that allow me to fill them with plenty of substrate. A pencil or stick can be used to create a starter burrow in the deep packed substrate. As spiderlings grow, I place them in larger vials until they have the leg span approximately of a quarter, which is when they are moved into deli cups, such as you see here. These are excellent rearing containers and also allow for good depths of substrate and high visibility. The number of containers that could be suitable for rearing young tarantulas is vast, but a few other containers worth commenting on are these attractive small display boxes that can be found at craft stores such as Michael's, and these nice stackable acrylic collectibles containers which are made by Pioneer Plastics and are intended for displaying matchbox car collections. Rearing a large number of tarantula spiderlings and vials can be made much easier with a little organization and record keeping. Here you see a group of Sterilite drawer style storage units filled with various size vials. An index card marked with species, quantity, and feeding and molting records is taped to the front of each drawer. Using this method it is easy to remove one drawer at a time and service all of the vials in that drawer. A quick glance at the index cards instantly tells you when the last time each spider within has been fed and allows you to ensure that an appropriate feeding schedule is maintained. This is much less time consuming than recording that info on each individual vial and eliminates guessing which spiderlings have been fed recently. It is also convenient to move one drawer full of vials to another location for feeding or other maintenance. Earlier Danielle showed us the very popular Critter Keepers and Herp Havens, which are excellent basic tarantula enclosures that provide good visibility and ventilation in a space saving design. There is another type of container that makes good use of space and that is the plastic storage container. Here you see an example of how a large number of adult tarantulas can be housed for breeding in storage containers. The large 66 quart tubs in this photo are set up for arboreal tarantulas, but the same containers can be three quarters filled with substrate for giant terrestrial or burrowing species. The shallow tubs are good for medium large tarantulas that don't require deep burrows. Tubs like these are very popular with reptile and amphibian keepers, and their use is becoming increasingly popular with arachnoculturists. The number of styles and sizes make them suitable for every species and allow tarantulas of all sizes and lifestyles to be housed in a minimum of space. Let's quickly look at a few styles. This type of container is good for many medium sized tarantulas. This plastic storage tub is approximately 9 inches tall and allows for a good 5 to 6 inch depth of substrate which I consider to be a good minimum. Remember, substrate depth is important so that the lower strata can contain more moisture and gradually evaporate to produce essential humidity while the upper layers in contact with the spider are drier. Note how ventilation holes have been added around the perimeter of the tub using an inexpensive soldering iron. The 
sharp drill bit can also be used to produce the holes, but this method risks cracking the brittle plastic if too much pressure is applied and also results in a mess of plastic bits drilled from the hole. The soldering iron is a quicker and cleaner method. Just make sure that you are careful around the hot tip and make the holes in a very well ventilated area. Looking inside the tub you can see the coconut core substrate which is wetted at one end so that the bottom layers become re-moistened as needed and both a vertical and horizontal moisture gradient is created. A coconut shell hiding place in a shallow ceramic dish of clean water containing a few stones to prevent cricket or roach drowning are added. As you can see here the spider, in this case an immature male Megaphobema robustum, has dug itself a burrow underneath its hiding place and the tunnel goes down to the bottom of the tub. This very large tub, a 66 quart Sterilite Clearview box, is excellent for the very large terrestrial tarantulas, especially New World General like Pampabedius, Xenethus, and Theraphosa. In fact, because of the size and depth of substrate required, there are few alternatives for housing these giant spiders. I have this tub filled with coconut fiber, but if you are going to work with a number of these spiders, you will definitely want to consider a less expensive alternative. My friends Billy and Bruce at Theraphosa Breeding Project, who specialize in these giant tarantula spiders, use a mixture of peat moss and sand. You can buy three or four cubic foot bales of peat moss at garden centers for about five dollars. Starter burrows aren't necessary for these species. If they choose to tunnel, they will easily dig arm length holes into the damp mixture. A good retreat to add is a concave piece of cork bark angled and partially sunk into the top of the substrate. A very heavy crock of clean water completes their housing. If necessary, rows of tubs such as these can be heated using reptile heat tape or cable, or individual tubs can be heated with individual heat pads taped to the back with duct tape. Of course, all supplemental heat sources should be thermostatically controlled for both safety and proper temperature maintenance. Perhaps the most versatile of the tubs are these tall models with latching lids. The container you see here is set up for a deep burrowing species of the genus Hapopelma, but the same tub, set up in a different manner, is just as useful for housing arboreal species. This is the Sterilite Show-Off, model 1896. The Asian obligate burrowers, such as the popular cobalt blue Haplopoma levitum, have very special requirements and their detractors refer to them as pet holes because they spend most of their time out of sight. However, this behavior is necessary for their long-term good health. This tub is modeled after the glass Haplopelma tanks designed by Germans Martin Huber and Volker von Wirth in that they have drainage holes at the bottom so the tubs can be periodically flooded with the spider still inside. A thorough discussion of this type of housing will have to wait for tarantulas in the terrarium volume 2, but let's take a quick look at this setup. Ventilation holes are placed around the perimeter near the top, but a row of holes is also placed near the bottom of one of the short ends, in this case the front. This allows the substrate to be thoroughly rinsed and wetted while allowing excess water to drain. A starter burrow is made by placing a length of bamboo, dowel, or broom handle in one of the front corners. Substrate is then packed around it until it is within three or four inches of the top. Here you can see that the substrate has been packed tightly around the bamboo piece and it's near the top just below the ventilation holes that surround the perimeter of the tub. The burrow forming pole is then gently twisted and withdrawn to leave behind a tunnel retreat. A spider such as a Haplopelma will happily adopt this as its home and will allow you to use a flashlight to check on the spider even if you don't ever see it outside of its lair. Over time, silk, debris, and waste will obscure your view but a damp bit of towel or sponge held with large forceps or an old toothbrush taped to a dowel can be used to clean the plastic and improve visibility. This is a uh, cereal storage dispenser that can be used much the same as the previous tub. It's a little more narrow, it's good for juvenile haplopelma, some of the smaller chelobrachis, and as you can see it has the same holes drilled at the bottom for draining, and has the same holes at the top perimeter and has a little handy little door that can be opened to feed the spider and these can also be used for arboreal tarantulas or filled with earth such as in a previous example for some of your burrowing species. 
Being an arboreal tarantula specialist, the type of clear plastic storage container most prevalent in my facility is the Rubbermaid gallon jar and its smaller half gallon counterpart. For about $3 plus the cost of the inside decor, you have an excellent simple enclosure for arboreal tarantulas up to about 4 inches in leg span. I use them for rearing juveniles and keeping adult male Pacillotheria, and they are large enough for even adult females of some of the smaller Avicularia species or all of the genus Tapnicinius. Ventilation holes are placed in the lid as well as on each side about two-thirds of the way up the height. I also place a set of holes closer to the level of the substrate to aid in preventing overly wet conditions. Several inches of coconut core is added and I often cover this with some orchid, decorative, or live green moss. A vertical cork bark slab and or bamboo or cork tube is provided for retreats for hole dwelling spiders such as Pacillotheria, while I tend to use more soap plant for vegetation loving tarantulas like a Vix. The water dish is similar to that I use in all of my arboreal cages. It is made from two individual two ounce condiment cups. You can buy these in bulk at restaurant supply stores and warehouse clubs or just pick up a small number when you are in a restaurant or diner. One cup is adhered to the side about two thirds of the way up and is the holder. The other cup is removable and replaceable and is the actual water dish. It can be cleaned or discarded as needed. The way I adhere the holder cup to the side is different depending on the type of cage. Later we will look at using suction cups and aquarium silicone, which are two methods I use for glass cages. But for the plastic tubs such as these gallon jars I use hot glue. The reason is that it sets up quickly and holds very well, yet will break off cleanly to make it much easier to clean the container. Here you can see an organized way to keep a, a number of smaller containers from the gallon jar and half gallon jars down to 32 ounce and 16 ounce deli cups. These are the materials and tools required to make a very simple and effective elevated water bowl for an arboreal tarantula enclosure. Here you see the finished product which is basically just a two ounce condiment cup which you can find in any kind of little diner or restaurant. You can buy them in quantity at a restaurant supply store or from some of the big, uh, big Sam's Club type of stores. Um, there's two of these two ounce cups. One's the holder, the inner ones uh, can be discarded or washed and removed, and a suction cup holds it up to the side. So let's just see how we make that really quickly. The key ingredient, if you will, are, is a small suction cup that has a little hook attachment. Um, this brand here is by Holmes, and I find them at Target. If you look closely at this style of suction cup, you'll see that it has a little hook on it and that hook fits into a little groove on the suction cup and that's important to our design but we're not going to use the hook we're just going to take the hook off and have the suction cup left behind. As you can see that groove where the hook was was going to be how the suction cup is held into our condiment cup. A soldering iron is used to make the hole in the side of the suction cup and it's best to do it in the well ventilated area. I'll just take this one apart. You can see the hole that was made and now how that will fit in that groove and hold. Now, adding a little moisture here, I can mount this suction cup to the side of an terrarium and I can use the inner cup here to fill with water. Here's a closer view of it mounted, the single holder cup. I put a second cup inside in order to hold the water. This way I can throw it away when it gets dirty. I'll fill it up with water. I like to use my little turkey baster. And once it's filled with clean water, I'll put a little sprig of silk plant in there to prevent crickets or roaches from drowning in the water. That's it. A common 10 gallon aquarium stood on end so that it is oriented vertically can make an excellent and inexpensive enclosure for large arboreal tarantulas. They might not be as attractive as some of the fancier tanks such as the Exeter Glass Terrarium, but aquariums can be found cheap at yard sales and discount stores and I'm going to show you how to convert one into a very functional arboreal tarantula cage with the addition of a specific ESU reptile screen cover with a hinge door. This is the number 22105 ESU tough top screen cover with medium mesh and a hinged door. This is going to be the front of our cage. First thing we're going to do is lay it inside up and 
cover the inside except for the door with clear packing tape. The packing tape serves two purposes. Number one, it reduces ventilation to aid in elevated humidity. Usually I preach about increasing ventilation in order to prevent stagnant conditions, but in this case the ventilation provided just in the door area is plenty. A secondary purpose is to protect the tarsi, feet if you will, of the tarantula from being caught in the screening and to keep waste inside the cage. Arboreal tarantulas often defecate on the inside walls of their cages, and with these tanks you will find that the tarantulas will more often than not do so on the front, which will be covered by this clear packing tape. This makes it very easy to periodically clean the cage by removing the lid, which is our front, and replacing the tape. One comment on tape. You get what you pay for and the $2 cheapo generic tape is very thin and does not work as well. Splurge on heavy duty scotch ultra clear storage tape at 4 or 5 bucks a roll and you'll have a much stronger and more transparent finished product. Apply the tape neatly from end to end. A dispenser like this makes it very easy to cut appropriate length. But you can also use a little razor knife to trim the excess if you need to. Again, skip only the door area. If your spider room is abnormally humid, you can remove a bit more of the tape to increase ventilation. Overlap each piece of tape a little bit, and like I said, the excess can be cut off, trimmed with a little sharp knife. Take a tank that has been cleaned with antibacterial dish soap and warm water, and then rinse very well and stand it on end on something like a stool. Although the next step could be considered optional, I feel that it is very important to this design. As I always stress, substrate depth is very important so that the lower strata can be kept more moist and water will naturally evaporate, causing additional humidity within the cage. The tape that we've placed on the front won't by itself keep all of the substrate, nor all of the water will periodically add to the substrate or any live plants within the cage. I use clear acrylic. This sheet costs about $2 at a large home center. Because I make a lot of these cages, I have a little wood template that is the size I want to cut the plastic to, and I can quickly mark the acrylic and cut it. They make special knives for cutting this acrylic sheeting, but I use my neighbor's vertical bandsaw to make quick work of it. Once the dam is cut, it is secured inside the molding of what would normally be the top of the aquarium using aquarium safe silicone. Make sure that you put the silicone all the way around the inside of what would be the dam before you press it against it for a watertight seal. Hold it for a minute while it bonds. Once the dam is dried in place you can add your substrate. Adding a drainage layer of clay aggregate at the bottom at first can be helpful, but let's keep it simple here. My substrate of choice is coconut core, and I'm going to add a good depth and slope it toward the back of the cage. Depth at the front of the cage will be just below the dam, but it'll be deeper toward the rear. For Psyllotheria and Salmopeus, I also like to provide a vertical piece of bamboo that has an entrance slot drilled into the side. I cut the 2 inch diameter length just short of 19 and 3 quarter inches in height, which makes it wedge perfectly between the bottom and the top. This needs to be installed before we do too much else with the decor inside the terrarium. Next, I usually cover the substrate with some attractive live moss or dry oak leaves. Here I'm going to use a moss that any of you could pick up at a reptile shop or online reptile supply retailer. This is a Zilla's Beaked Moss.
I personally like to use live plants for both natural humidity production and aesthetic value and will sink an inexpensive potted plant into the substrate. Choose a cheap plant that requires low light and moderate watering. This is pothos which is exceptional. It's very cheap, very sturdy leaves, easy to wash species off of and they'll tolerate just about any kind of lighter water conditions. A vertical piece of cork bark in one of my suction cup elevated water dishes completes the necessary decor, but use your imagination and create a terrarium that you will enjoy looking at for months to come. Final step is to place the screen cover and secure it to the front by wrapping black electrical tape around the perimeter. Electrical tape stretches and if you do a neat job it will not only hold the cover that has become our front in place, but it will also blend in with the black molding of the aquarium and the black aluminum of the screen cover so that it actually disappears. I like to take uh, this one step further. Contrary to popular belief, I don't think it's desirable to have a sterile environment. With these natural vivaria, I want to inoculate the substrate with organic material, including little living cage cleaners, like these Spanish orange Purcellio uh, isopods, or any of the trichorina or other uh, tropical wood lice. So by adding this, which has a bunch of them in there, into the terrarium, this will feed on any mold or fungi or dead uh, crickets or roaches or anything like that and they'll breed within this cage and allow a breakdown of material just as would happen in nature. This is a simple 10 gallon on end enclosure that can be built for around 20 to 25 dollars. Arboreal tarantulas are excellent candidates for beautiful naturalistic vivaria and we're going to go step by step through constructing an attractive planted display tank for Avicularia metallica using the 12 inch square and 18 inch tall Exoterra glass terrarium. For the bottom substrate layer, I like to provide drainage and a reservoir for excess water to evaporate back into the terrarium, which will provide beneficial natural humidity. This lightweight and inexpensive clay aggregate is used in hydroponic gardens and can be found at indoor gardening supply stores or through online vendors. After thoroughly rinsing the clay pebbles to get rid of dust, several inches is added to the bottom of the terrarium. If you choose, you can slope it toward the rear to create a hilly interior, but here I'm going to place it so it is level. Next I'm going to add two plants to the back wall of the terrarium. The first is of the genus Veresia and it will be attached directly to the back, so I wrap its roots with damp live moss and secure it with floral wire. The plant and supporting clumps of moss are then affixed to the back wall of the terrarium using hot glue. This is a closer look at the first plant being supported by moss clumps that are glued to the contoured face of the fake rock wall insert that comes with the Exoterra glass terrarium. Next I will add a potted bromeliad by first removing it from its small plastic pot, watering it well, and then screwing the empty pot to the foam insert with a dr short drywall screw. Once the pot is attached to the back, I put some hot glue on the outside so I can affix additional moss to hide the plastic pot and add to the natural beauty of the terrarium. Here the pot is surrounded by green terrarium moss. Next my bromelia can be returned to its pot and watered with an organic fertilizer. On the left side of the terrarium I'm going to add an attractive piece of gator wood for a little additional aesthetics and then I'm going to add two types of ground plant which will have their roots supported by the clay aggregate before I add several inches of damp coconut core. 
Next, a thin layer of orchid moss is added, and the ground cover of live and decorative moss is placed on top of it. The orchid moss provides rooting surfaces for the live moss, and once everything is added, the terrarium is then sprayed down with tepid, purified water. Now the terrarium is ready to go, and all it needs is, is the spider, in this case, a female Avicularia metallica. Finally, a screw-type low wattage fluorescent bulb is going to be added to provide essential light for the terrarium plants as well as slightly elevated daytime temperature. In turn, the live plant's respiration will provide beneficial humidity to the air in the manner nature intended. Supplemental evaporation from the drainage layer, which will be kept wet, will also add humidity that will cycle out the screen top and thus avoid stagnant, overly wet conditions. This Exoterra vivarium is set up to house ornamental tarantulas of the genus Bacillotheria. This is my standard adult female breeding cage. Although it still has a live plant for the natural humidity the plant's respiration will provide, it is a bit simpler and doesn't require the frequent watering of the more involved vivarium we just looked at. The substrate is similar but the design is more open with a vertical slab of cork bark and a bamboo tube to provide retreats. The plants used are those that require very little light and moderate moisture. Drinking water is provided in a double 2 ounce condiment cup attached to the side with a suction cup. There are a number of tools that can make tarantula husbandry more efficient and safer for both you and your spiders. The two that I feel are essential for every tarantula keeper are forceps and artist brushes. I recommend having one long set of rubber tip forceps such as these 12 inches and a set of smaller fine tip forceps. These tools can perform a number of functions. The large forceps are especially good for removing molts and debris or small water cups, while the smaller forceps are great for doing the same thing in small containers like vials and I also use them to select individual crickets or roaches out of a cup to make feeding a large number of spiderlings move along much quicker. Some dollar store cheapo um, artist brushes are essential for gently manipulating small spiders to move to another container and I use this large brush here for adults. Flashlights are always useful and I use a headlamp when I'm feeding my tarantulas in a dark room at night. A turkey baster of water is great for filling water dishes or wetting substrate. It allows you to reach elevated water dishes with ease and you can plunge it down into the deep layers of substrate in order to just wet the bottom. Finally, a window scraper such as this with a nice sharp razor blade is essential if you have arboreal tarantulas as you can scrape feces off the front of the glass when you're uh, doing your cage maintenance. The kind people who don't indiscriminately kill every spider or insect they find in their homes long ago discovered that the best method for catching bugs and releasing them outdoors without having to touch them was to use a glass and a thin piece of card or heavy paper. The safest way to move tarantulas, both for the spider and keeper, evolves from that simple glass and card method. However, here you see not glasses or the popular deli cup, but cut plastic bottles made from a 2 liter soda bottle and a 1 liter and a half liter water bottle. I will demonstrate why these devices are superior to the good old glass, or for that matter a deli cup or similar container. The tarantula coaxed into the, a funnel shaped bottle. will usually settle in and be easy to move. A piece of can be used to trap the spider or a paintbrush like I use can be used to direct it into the funnel. But even this burrowing tarantula is going to act like an arboreal and stay up inside the funnel once it's trapped up there. And now the easy thing is if I'm going to move it back to another container I'll just put it back where I collected it from for this example. But is now instead of having to go into it and prod it back out I can take this cap off here which I left on to give me a nice little handle. But if I take the cap off, the spider is too big to fit through there, I can coax it out with the paintbrush or I can even just give a little gentle breath like that and get it to roll right out. Let's look at that again.
Obviously you want to choose your size container to make sure that the trench that you're dealing with can't come out the other end. But now once you move it, rather than having the cumbersome and clumsy little trying to get underneath it with a brush here, I can actually take it back to the cage and use a smaller brush to go through the opening here, or better still, a little breath. will generally pop it right back out nice and neat. So different sizes of these containers for different size spiders are really safe ways to move them without touching them, especially when you have a big defensive spider like this apple palma, Elvis Triatum. The domestic cricket is the staple feeder item of arachnoculture. It can be found at just about every pet store and bait shop is inexpensive and is readily accepted by tarantulas. I am known as a bit of an outspoken critic of crickets and I'll explain why, but for most tarantula keepers the cricket is a perfectly good tarantula food. For those of you who have just a small number of tarantulas, crickets are a great choice. I want to stress that regardless of the negative aspects of crickets that I'm about to discuss, they are the most readily available and convenient food for most keepers and there actually is very little risk of using them. So what are their downsides? Well, they have a short lifespan, stink, make noise, attract, and are often shipped along with other pet insects, may be vectors for parasites like nematodes, and are infamous for gnawing at and killing tarantulas that are either not hungry or molting or otherwise won't defend themselves. Crickets are pretty easy to care for whether you keep them in a small container like a critter keeper or a plastic tub or a 10 gallon aquarium or if you keep them in a larger cage such as you see here. The crickets are housed without a substrate in a dry warm cage with vertical pieces of egg carton to give them plenty of surfaces and maximize the number that can be fit in a small area. They're fed water from cricket gel or cricket quencher that it's available readily in reptile stores and pet stores um, or you can make your own much cheaper by buying it in bulk from a company like watersorb.com. Polycrylamide crystals are commonly used in soil to provide moisture and adding these crystals to water will give you all the quick cricket quencher as we like to call it that you'll need. I just give them a dry food that's an excellent blend. Um, there's plenty of recipes online to make your own but uh, for a really good blend that incorporates a lot of different uh, quality foods um, it's best to just let somebody else buy all the, the variety of ingredients and uh, I buy mine from cricketfood.com. Crickets only live about seven weeks. The large size many pet and bait stores sell are six weeks old plus and you will have significant die-offs every day if you purchase a number of them. The females, the ones with the long ovipositors sticking out of their rears, will be laying eggs and the males will be chirping and making all sorts of racket. If you use this large size and your spider doesn't eat them right away, there is the danger of them laying eggs in your tarantula's enclosure, which if the temperature and humidity are high enough will result in baby crickets hatching in a tarantula cage a couple of weeks later. If you use large crickets in natural vivaria that have many places for crickets to hide from the spider, I recommend only two males, the ones without the ovipositors, to avoid the cricket hatchery situation. But generally you can find crickets available at all ages of life. Um, what we call pinheads. Uh, true pinheads are hard to find. They are literally the size of a pinhead. What's usually sold as pinheads are one week old crickets. And you know these are about a quarter of an inch long and uh, most of your larger spiderlings can take them. And your tiny spiderlings will, will gladly scavenge off of a uh, larger cricket cut in half. But one week old are good for spiderlings. Two week for a little bit larger. And you usually find what's called medium the four week going up to the larger crickets, which I mentioned are best to avoid unless you want to listen to a lot of chirping and risk having eggs laid in your cages. Here you see my roach breeding rack. On the bottom shelf is my primary colony of blabberous hybrids, uh, Discoidellus, Cranifer, and Fusca, kind of all three species combined. Um, this is, these are my fastest reproducers and my primary 
uh, prey that I offer tarantulas. Um, on the middle shelf there are two additional species of blabberus um, in the in the kind of gray containers. Those are your more standard uh, storage tubs that a lot of people raise the roaches in. Um, we won't look at those, we'll look at the, the one on the bottom, my primary one in a little more detail. But all these roach tubs are heated from below and thermostatically controlled. They're heated with common reptile heat pads. Um, roaches will reproduce at temperatures uh, around 75 degrees, maybe even a little bit lower. But uh, for real good reproduction, if you want to breed quantities for, uh, for food, you're looking at temperatures in excess of 85 degrees. I know people who have roach rooms that get up to 100 degrees and their uh, production doubles. So these are all heated to keep them very warm and dry and um, they're fed often and uh, produce a lot of roaches this way. On the top shelf is a, a 10 gallon aquarium that houses my uh, bladder lateralis also known as Shelfadella tartara, commonly known as uh, Red Runners or Turkestan roaches. And this is an ideal non-climbing small species that is really good. The little babies are, the little nymphs are small enough for even the tiniest spiderlings and it's good to have both a larger species of roach and a smaller species of roach if you are uh, going to be producing a bunch. Um, I personally don't keep any of the climbing species. Um, the best known ones are the Madagascan hissing as far as large ones and the lobster roaches as far as the smaller species go. Um, I do this just because it's uh, they're harder to contain and they're messier. The hissing roaches uh, have a little bit of an odor as far as I'm concerned and have harder exoskeletons. So really I've kind of narrowed it down. Um, species I don't work with that are really good are any of the Eublabarus, the orange-headed Prosticus, and the six-spotted Distanti. Um, those are very good, and a lot of people use the Blaptica dubia. Uh, the, I think they call it the Guiana spotted roach, and that's an excellent roach species as well. But uh, my blabber species keep me in all the roaches I need, so uh, I'm not working with those currently. Um, the top left tub there is uh, my compost tub where I raise porcelio, um, isopods, and other types of wood lice in order to uh, put cleaners in the naturalistic terraria that we'll talk about and I'll show you that one as well. But we're going to look at the uh, the big roach tub where I house my blabberus in a little more detail and see how it's heated and the temperature is regulated. This gives you a little closer look at the larger tub which is a 28 gallon Rubbermaid Max Latch uh, storage tub. Uh, I like it because it's translucent so I can see inside and it's got a very tight fitting securing latching lid um, and again you can see the thermostatic controller uh, which is made by ESU Reptile. It's a standard uh, reptile heat pad controller and the thermometer that's on top of it. Now we'll take a look at the back of it where you'll be able to see the heat source. Here looking at the back of the tank you can see that there's a large reptile heat mat. Uh, this is a Thermotronics 12 inch by 24 inch heat pad but you can also find at reptile expos and stores. You can find the flex watt that you can buy by the foot and get a two foot length of 11 inch wide flex watt. Or there's also the Exoterra or Zoomed brands of uh, under tank type of heaters or heat mats that can be used. But uh, this is affixed to the back of the enclosure using black duct tape. And once again, it's uh, plugged into a ESU Reptile thermostatic controller to make sure that uh, my desired temperature is maintained and also prevent, uh, in case there's a short or malfunction, to prevent overheating, which could be a fire risk or at least cause damage and melting to the container. And here with the top removed, you can see the thermostatic controller and thermometer once again and the probes descending to the substrate. Here I've got the water and food dishes removed so that you can just see the basic setup. Um, the substrate that I like to use, which is about three or four inches deep, is called Beta Chip, which is a uh, kiln dried hardwood that's fairly sterile and is commonly used by uh, university laboratories for their rodent colonies and other small animals. Um, can be a little more difficult to find than some of the other substrates you could use, but if you go to a, uh, a large feed store, usually one that uh, is like a Purina outlet or something like that. A lot of times they'll deal with your local universities and they'll have this 
and uh, it's 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 very clean. It's like I said, it's a kiln dried hardwood, so it's a very clean and it's very low dust, and it's a it's a good substrate to use. Um, there are plenty of substrates you can use, and a lot of roach people don't even like to use substrates. But uh, an argument about the substrates to use is beyond the scope of what we have time to talk about here. But uh, I've had good luck with this. I've also had good luck with aspen. I've had good luck with coconut or peat. Um, whatever you find is uh, it works out best for you as long as you can keep it clean and dry and uh, avoid mold. Other end, you can see the egg cartons where the uh, where the roaches actually live. This gives them plenty of vertical roosting surfaces and maximizes the amount of roaches you can have in a container. This security is is necessary for them and allows you to have a very large colony contained in a small tub. Um, you can see that I, what I do is I like to use these vertical pieces of egg carton, which uh, is pretty common, but I've taken it a step further by building this box here, which allows you to nest the egg cartons together with opposite spot sides facing so that they don't collapse together, and this holds this all in place really nicely. Uh, it's a good idea, a little scrap wood, build it for however you want to hold four or five or six of these boxes, and I can take the whole box out and pull out a whole bunch of roaches at once when I'm cleaning um, or I can just if I want to get it a certain size I can just pick up a pick up a layer and push it back in and then I just have a couple extra pieces that I've leaned up against it just because there's plenty of room within this uh, within this large tub. Now I'm going to return the food dishes which is basically I've just got some three and a half inch diameter deli cups which I've cut down to make little disposable trays so I don't have to wash them, waste a bunch of time. I can just discard these when they're done. I'm going to fill one of them with cricket gel, polyamide, polycrylamide crystal, lysed water, and the other one I'm going to fill with the dry diet that I use, which is the roach food produced by cricketfood.com. And this has got all kinds of good ingredients in it. You'd spend a fortune buying all these ingredients on your own and making your own custom mix. There's people that make mixes with things like Laina unmedicated chick mash. There's people that use all kinds of different grains. Um, fish food can be used. You can see how much these guys like this. I mean, they'll go through several dishes of this a day. And the nice thing about the dry food and the cricket quencher is it's sufficient for most of their needs and doesn't attract the fruit flies that a lot of fresh fruit would. Still though, I like to give them a little variety and I'll give them some extra dark greens. Um, also squashes, zucchini and yellow squashes are really good. Occasional orange slices, banana and apple, fruits like that. Um, but once again, those do attract a lot of fruit flies so you want to get them out of there as quickly as possible. So I use a lot of this dry food. Um, you, know, you can use uh, rice cereal, baby rice cereal, you can use mixed baby cereal, you can use ground up um, grains, ground up cereals, you can uh, use dog food, other types of cereals, um, you know, like kid cereal, um, ground up in a blender. But uh, for nutrition and all the ingredients, uh, if you go to cricketfood.com and you look at all the ingredients that are in this roach diet, it's just uh, something that I've been really happy with using and I know they're getting maximum nutrition and so are my spiders because they're eating these healthy roaches. Sexing these roaches is quite easy and it's important to make sure you've got pairs and when I feed off adults I try to feed off mostly males instead of using up my females. Here you see a male. His terminal segment of his abdomen here, sternite, is the same width as the rest of the segments on his abdomen. It's very narrow I don't know if you can see it closely here, but this last one is about the same width as these other ones. Let's find a female here. And in this female, hopefully this will show up on the camera, but this, this terminal segment right here is twice the width of these other sternites. So this is a female, and she's going to produce me a bunch of babies, so if I'm going to feed off an adult, I'm going to try to grab males. Of course, if you do this for a long time, you start running the risk that you don't have enough mail. So always make sure you have enough, or better still, just go through your colony and look for some of the larger nymphs, male or female, that you can uh, feed off.
you can see here that the little tiny nymphs are pretty small. Try again there. They're pretty small and they can feed pretty small tarantulas. I mean these would be good for a tarantula that's about a half inch in leg span. But for your smaller tarantulas, that's why I raised an even smaller species, Blatolateralis, and that's what we're going to look at now. An essential addition to your roach cage is to have a non-toxic aphid trap, such as this BioCare brand. These yellow sticky traps, you can see I have one hanging here from the lid, and it hangs straight down and catches any of the forward flies or fruit flies that are attracted to the dead roaches, fruit, and such. This 10 gallon aquarium houses Blatolateralis, also called the Red Runners or Turkestan roaches. These roaches have become exceptionally popular because they reproduce very quickly and produce very small nymphs that can be fed to even the tiniest spiderlings. You can see how these roaches got their nickname the Red Runners. They're very quick and they're kind of reddish in color. The females are kind of a reddish brown becoming more brown as adults, kind of a burgundy color, whereas the males are more of a blonde and have the wings and look much more like the, the pest roach that uh, people try to keep out of their houses. And I should make the point that the reason these things look so similar to your pest roaches is that because they are very closely related. They're in the same genus as your, uh, your German or your American cockroach pests. So if you do decide to raise these, you want to make sure that you do contain them. You do not want to uh, get them out because there is the possibility that these can survive outside, the ca uh, outside their cage and become a pest. A lot of people like to keep these roaches without any substrate at all. Um, I use kind of dry coconut fiber. Um, their other common name, Turkestan roach, gives you an idea of where they're from. Um, they are an arid climate roach and uh, will do pretty well under relatively dry conditions. If you look at this female that I have on my hand right here, you can see the one thing that's very different with these roaches compared to most of the other roaches that are raised in the hobby. Whereas all roaches technically produce egg cases, most of your blabberous, you blabberous, your hissers, everything else that is popularly bred will produce an egg sac like this and have it protrude from their abdomen. Just running up my arm, let me see if I can get her back in the camera. They'll produce them outside their abdomen like this, but then they'll turn them and they'll draw them back inside and the egg sac will basically hatch within the female, giving kind of a pseudo-live birth. With these Blatolateralis, they actually deposit these egg cases in the substrate or just on top of the ground for those who don't use substrate, and they hatch externally. Um, like I said, these are very hardy and they're used to the arid climate, so the egg cases hatch without problem. Uh, one advantage having these external egg cases does give you is that you can take the egg sacs out and incubate them yourselves in, in little cups and then by that way you, when they hatch you'll have all of the same size little hatchlings and you can have a bunch of different cups with different age nymphs so you can feed different size spiderlings from one cup full of nymphs that are the same age therefore not having to go through the cage and pick out individually sized nymphs. So, that's kind of a benefit of these is being able to produce a certain size in one container and not having to sort later. Here with the tub removed you can see the reptile heat mat that is heating this roach tub. The way the shelf is designed allows enough airflow around the heat mat to prevent any excessive heat or the risk of fire or melting the plastic of the tub. You always want to make sure if you're setting underneath an aquarium or a tub of any kind that you raise it up a quarter of an inch to half an inch at least so that there is some airflow around the heat mat and once again you always want to have your heat mat plugged into a rheostat or a thermostat to prevent any kind of risk. Superworms or Zephobus can be an excellent tarantula food. They're very easy to take care of and feed. Um, much less problematic than crickets. Um, the only problem when using any type of a beetle larvae or grub is that it will burrow into the substrate if the tarantula doesn't grab it right away. So these are best offered to tarantulas that have a very good feeding response and will immediately pounce on them. And They can also be offered by for with, uh, with forceps to arboreal tarantulas or terrestrials for that matter. So this is a really excellent food uh, for any type of tarantula. These regular mealworms, Tenebrio molitor, 
um, are the larvae of a darkling beetle. And they're very popular in the pet trade, although they do have hard exoskeletons and are a little hard for lizards to digest. And they're uh, very easy to keep for an extended period of time because you can keep them in a refrigerator and not worry about feeding them. Waxworms, or Galleria melanella, are the larvae of a wax moth, which is actually a parasite on bee nests. Um, they're a good food that can also be used for tarantulas. A lot of people feed them to lizards and frogs as well. Um, they're a little more difficult to keep alive. They get shipped in sawdust, and uh, you can see here there was some a little bit of wood chips, and they won't last long that way. If you look online, you can find recipes for mixes that allow them to keep alive for a much longer period of time and gives them food to eat, but it's difficult to extract them from them because they'll actually make little silk nests inside of that type of food. Once you start keeping a bunch of tarantulas, you're going to have old substrate that you have nothing to do with. And making a little compost tub like this is a great idea. If you do any gardening, it can be great as compost fertilizer for that. But what I do is I put all my old moss and my old substrate into here and I inoculate it with some of the tropical wood lice like Trichorina or the Spanish orange isopod Bercellio and uh, you won't be able to see them on the camera here but these little guys are all this is teeming with some of these little cage cleaners and they'll live in here and feed on this and I can come in here and grab a good handful of this composting that's got all kinds of little bacteria and little stuff breaking down the, the organic matter so I can put this into my cage and create an active environment to where there's flora and fauna of, of little cage cleaners that are helping me keep things, uh, keep things clean rather than having a sterile, uh, very unnatural environment where any kind of any organic material like a dead cricket, for example, is going to just be left there to rot and attract forward flies. Using a, a, some of these cage cleaners to attack that and eat up the mold or fungi or waste animals, waste prey will allow you to uh, here's, one of these, here's one of these orange guys right now But these Spanish orange isopods uh, are great cleaners, great big uh, wood lice type of cleaners that will get into the, the cage and break down any leftover crickets or roaches or any mold or fungus that, uh, that, that uh, starts to grow in there and that will uh, prevent the attraction of forward flies and fruit flies and other pests. So beneficial animals in the substrate prevent pest animals from entering your cages. If you have a sterile uh, environment like a vermiculite cage with a, uh, with a ceramic crock in it and nothing else, any kind of dead animal is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to be left in there and is going to attract pests. Whereas if you have these little guys in there to clean all that up, uh, it'll break it down. So you're looking for a natural cycle, not some kind of a sterile laboratory environment for a tarantula. Contrary to popular belief and what some uh, people still preach. The idea of any style of incubation container is to provide appropriate warmth and humidity while protecting the egg sac from pests such as forward flies and contamination from mold or fungus. The materials required for the style of incubation cup that I'm going to show you are two 6 inch diameter deli cups approximately 3 or 4 inches deep, one matching lid, some electrical tape, one or more rubber bands, a moisture retaining substrate such as vermiculite, and a paper towel or cheesecloth hammock. I'll go over each individually and discuss why I choose the exact materials I use. Two cups are required because this is a double cup system, which allows you to lift the inner container that has the egg sac suspended on a hammock away from the outer container 
that holds the vermiculite. This allows for accessing each separately and adding more moisture to the outer lower cup without disturbing the egg sac. That holds the hammock and egg sac has its bottom removed. These deli cups are from Superior Enterprise and are pre-punched for ventilation. The bottom cup contains moist substrate that provides essential humidity. There are some breeders who use just plain water, but I feel that substrate is safer in case the hammock should break, and I typically open the sack when spiderlings molt to first instar and allow them to rest directly on the vermiculite. Breeding is going to be the primary of focus of tarantulas in the triangle volume 2, but we will close volume 1 with a quick with mention of egg sack incubation. From first Although to this may at first star. seem like putting the cart before the horse, some beginners first experience with tarantula reproduction because is when a wild-caught female produces sterile, a very surprise egg sac. And holds moisture well. I mix it in warm water at a ratio of about two parts vermiculite to one part water by volume. It is best to err on the side of dryness as additional water can always be added as needed. And with this double cup system it is quite easy to monitor the moisture level and rehydrate the substrate when necessary. I block off the holes in the inner cup by circling the container with electrical tape. This is because I want the air that reaches the egg sac to pass only through the towel so that pest flies cannot reach the sac. The air will enter the punched holes that are in the outer full complete cup but will have to pass through the hammock in order to reach the sac which is resting above. After cutting off the lower third or so, I invert the bottom and slide the top portion over the top. This inverted bottom is only temporary and is used as a riser. Then I place my paper towel across the opening. Some breeders use cheesecloth or other material for the hammock, but I prefer to use heavy duty industrial paper towel, which can be found at hardware stores or home centers. It is strong yet permeable to air, and unlike cheesecloth, it will prevent even the smallest pests from reaching the sack. I stretch this across the opening of the cup and set my other cup on top of the towel to create a depression. The inverted bottom I placed inside as a temporary riser keeps the cup off the bottom creating the sagging of the hammock a few inches up. Then the towel is secured in this position by placing one or more rubber bands around the circumference. Here's the finished product. I've added a couple more rubber bands, made sure that the paper towel was stretched nicely and there were no gaps, and then wrapped electrical tape around to hold it all in place and trimmed off the excess toweling. Here you can see the finished product with the inner cup with the hammock placed inside of the outer cup. Because the bottom of the inner cup does cover up the pre-punched holes on the outside of the outer cup, I've made some pinprick holes at about the level of the substrate all the way around the circumference. It might be a little hard to see here. But this way the air is passing in above the substrate and then passing through the hammock itself to get at the egg sac and the egg sac is protected. And this is a, a six inch cup, a double cup system and it's appropriate for using with some of the uh, medium to medium large species of tarantula. Uh, it allows you plenty of room if there's a large number of of young to uh, spread out across the hammock once they have hatched or have reached at least first instar. Um, if you're using a smaller sack you can downsize and use uh, a more common like three and a half inch diameter deli cup and make a similar arrangement or uh, again use a much bigger one for some of the uh, tennis ball size egg sacks you might get from something like the Pamphibedias. But this works really well for uh, most size egg sacks. The incubator cup itself can be placed in an incubator such as used for reptile eggs or in a heated cabinet like those used to rear a number of young tarantulas. 
I simply place the cups on an upper shelf in my spider rooms where the temperature varies between 78 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and the low to mid 70s during the night. The date of the sack, the species, the ID number of the parents, or any other pertinent information is then written on the lid with a Sharpie permanent marker. Depending on when this sack was laid will determine whether I have to open the lid and turn it frequently. If it's a freshly laid sack, it will need to be rotated throughout the day to prevent the eggs from gelling together and allow them all to be gently massaged into place. If the eggs are further along, if they are budded so to speak, and they are becoming post embryos, then they can just be left alone. <clears throat> Normally what I'll do is I'll cut a small incision into a loose piece of the silk and peer into it to determine what stage it is. You can always twist this back up and seal the egg sac back shut or if you have difficulty you can kind of fold over the silk and use a tiny little piece of scotch tape to close it all back in. We have an exciting little find here. This is a female Pasolotheria petersoni with an egg sac. She had laid it underneath the moss behind a piece of cork bark and while maintaining the cage and uh, watering the plants and and uh, just basically cleaning the sides of the glass I moved the piece of cork bark and saw that she was under there. I had no idea that uh, she had laid her sack yet and uh, actually can't be sure exactly when it's laid so we're gonna, we're gonna open this one up together. Pacillotheria tend to be very good mothers and more often than not I'll leave the egg sack in the cage with the female a lot of people like to take them away at around 25 to 30 days and remove them for incubation outside but I think uh, when a cage is very well planted I've used all naturalistic vivarian leave the spiders alone that there's uh, not so much of a tendency for them to eat their egg sacs I think it uh, has more to do with being bothered or not feeling very comfortable and even though these are arboreal spiders with all the moss that I use in the bottom of the cage and the depth of substrate, I find that uh, most of them will burrow down and lay the egg sac kind of underground or in a little silk nest like this that was completely on the bottom of the tank. This is a, a vertical 10 gallon and we're looking at basically the bottom of the tank here. And uh, there was a piece of vertical cork bark that I've already pulled away. And that's where she, she laid her egg sac. So, um, I couldn't even make the decision whether to leave it with her or not. At this point I kind of have to take it away from her because I've disturbed her so much there is a chance that she would When you've got a lot of spiders and they're in naturalistic terraria um, and they're laying underground you know I've more, <laughs> very often I won't have any idea when exactly the sack was laid and that probably is another reason why I prefer to maternal incubation. Um, I really think the only problem with, with incubating egg sacs in the cage um, with spiders that are good mothers, I mean obviously some aren't but these are, um, the only real problem you have is if it hatches in within the cage it can be a little tricky to uh, recover all the babies and can be a little time consuming to go through every little piece of moss and substrate to make sure you've gotten all the babies and if the cage isn't secure obviously you have the risk of babies escaping as well but uh, Usually I'll let them hatch in the cage. There's no way they can get out of the cage the way I have the cages set up. And um, once I see them moving about, uh, you know, usually they'll stay in there with their mother even at second star instar and they'll be kind of clogged up in a place. So let's pull this egg sac out away from her and uh, let's open it up and see uh, what stage of development we have here. It's a nice white fluffy sac so hopefully it's looking pretty good. Um, and she's looking a little thin so we're going to get it out of there and and uh, give her a nice rush tonight. A lot of times what you need to do when the female is actually turning around and holding the egg sac is just use two sets of forceps, one in each hand or a little wooden spoon as a kind of a spatula divider shield and use forceps with your uh, your primary hand, right handed in my case, um, to take the sac away. Um, but because I've already disturbed her and I went to get the camera and everything and set it up she's uh, actually facing away from the egg sac right now so this is this is going to be easy and uh, these females you know they'll they'll usually let me take them pretty pretty gently I've even the uh, 
the more nervous species like Ornata, I can usually go in there and take them away, and the females will just calmly let me do it. So let me grab forceps, and uh, you can see there's a little bit of a little bit of a silk right here that will allow me to kind of pinch it and grab it. If not, you want to be really gentle and kind of go around it with rubber tip forceps, um, or you can even use two spoons together. But because I have this little little tab here, and uh, I don't really want to grab it around it because I'm kind of clumsy and don't want to crush it. So you can see my hands even shaking doing it like this because you want to be very gentle. But I think I can just. It's all right, girl. Just pull this sack out. Set it down so I can get a better grip. I've got a little clean uh, ceramic crop here. And I'm just going to transfer the egg sack over to that temporarily so I can carry it gently and then we'll transfer it to a incubator cup. Okay, girl, I've got the egg sack removed and before I put an incubator cup I'm going to put the front back on this cage and put her cork bark back and return to the shelves here so I can feed her. You can see her abdomen is a little small there from producing the egg sac and I'm sure she's very hungry. Alright, I've refurbished the moss and put the cork bark back where it is. As you can see here, it's a, one of my standard 10 gallon and end tanks with a full length of uh, bamboo upright and the females will usually use these as retreats uh, most of the time, except when they lay an egg sac. More often than not, they will go right down on the bottom, usually where the cork bark is, and make a little silk nest down underneath the substrate, just as this female did. Alright, let's see what we've got here. There's the egg sac I took away from the female. Here's an incubator cup, as I showed before. Um, inside of here is a little bit of cheesecloth. A lot of people use cheesecloth for the entire hammock. Uh, what I've just done here is take a few layers of it and set it there and it'll allow a little more air circulation around the egg sac when I set it on top of here. And uh, we're going to we're gonna open this together and uh, see if it's good or bad. And, uh, and I promise you that uh, no matter what we've got here it's going to stay in the DVD because of course you have just as so much failure if not more than success. So we want to see what we've got here regardless. The sac looks good but uh, I don't know how far along it is or what we've got inside. As I mentioned before, it's to snip it to look in, to actually peer inside the egg sac. You're looking for a little bit of extra silk to where you can cut through. And just as where I gripped it with the forceps to take it out of the cage here before, I'll be able to cut right through there. And I'll get some sharp scissors and we'll cut just a little incision to where we can look inside the egg sac and evaluate it. And if need be, if they're just um, if they're just embryos, eggs, or if they're just becoming post embryos or um, little nymphs just starting to bud, we'll seal that back up, we'll twist it back up, and we'll leave it in the egg sac and rotate it frequently. If they've already budded out and they're at post embryos, um, what people call eggs with legs, then we are going to uh, allow them out and allow them to disperse amongst the hammock and have a little more space to molt to first instar. Um, and then from there to second in Star Wars Spiderling. So let's uh, move this sack over here. All right, here I've got some sharp little uh, inexpensive scissors that you can get at a uh, cosmetics department of a drugstore or anything. Just some little fine tipped scissors and some fine forceps. And I'm going to grab this excess silk right here. And what I want to do is I want to be able to twist it back shut if needs to be resealed so I want to just kind of go in here to where I can get at it. I don't want to just cut off all that excess because that won't leave me anything to twist up and you won't actually get to see inside the egg sac if you just cut that off because that's just extra silk. Okay, now I can actually have a hole into the sack here. And 
and I can see that they're good eggs, but they haven't begun to bud. Let me see if I see any of them budding. Budding's kind of slang for when they start to get their little legs. You can start to see the legs in the egg as they start to become post embryos. And a more technical term is eclosion when they begin to develop. But these eggs are, are looking really good, but they are. Uh, I'm sure you can't see inside of there, but uh, they're not butted out, so we're not going to disperse them. So I'm going to seal that back up, and then this sack will get rotated, and it'll be another week or so before I look at it again. I've trimmed away a little bit of this excess silk that I was grabbing that I, when I kind of lifted it before. To get it out of the way to see if I can twist shut this hole. The hole is right here and if you have enough excess you can actually usually just twist it back shut. But I wasn't able to do that so I folded it over really nicely without drawing the sack tighter still leaving it nice and airy and what I'm going to do now is just take a little tiny little piece of scotch tape and just close that so when I'm rotating it I know that no eggs are going to fall out. I'll take a nice clean paint brush And then just make sure it adheres a little bit. Now I've got a nice fluffy egg sack suspended in my hammock. That I'll rotate a half a dozen times a day or so, making sure that it doesn't get any tighter. Check the moisture of my substrate. It's pretty good, just a little bit of dry. So I'm just going to add a little bit more warm water. Also increase the temperature a little bit right off the bat. Stir that up. Place my double cup system. Place the hammock back in. Make sure this fits down snugly. So the towel and the electrical tape that was around the towel can act as a gasket so no flies can get in there again. And then we're going to put a lid on it marked with the uh, pertinent information. And there we go. The Sotheria Petersoni, the female's ID number, and on the index card I'll have all the other information regarding the mating and the dates. Well, thanks for watching Tarantulas and Terrarium Volume 1. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it, and you'll visit ExoticFauna.com to learn about future volumes in this series, as well as other Exotic Fauna media projects, including Arachniculture Magazine. If you have any specific questions, you can email me at ExoticFauna at gmail.com. Please be concise and allow at least a few days for response. Um, until next time, I'm Michael Jacoby, reminding you to respect and protect all the wonders of nature, including big hairy spiders. Thanks. There's our director, H.D. Taylor. Who's a pretty girl? Who's a pretty girl? Where's the rat? Where's the rat?